Welcome everyone to WeCan's fourth and final webinar in our roundtable series on empowering community to become engaged with local governments and elect climate champion councils. The title of our roundtable today is Municipal Campaigning 101, and our focus is on election strategies for climate champions and how to run a successful campaign. My name is Heather Bates, and I'm one of the volunteers on the West Coast Climate Action Network's local government team. I'm also on the board of directors of WeCan and the Nanaimo Climate Action Hub. WeCan works to serve, support, amplify, and promote the multitude of climate action organizations and initiatives in BC. Before we get started, I'd like to do a brief land acknowledgement. And while I do so, please feel free to note your own land acknowledgement from wherever you're calling in from in the chat. As we gather today, we acknowledge that the land we now refer to as British Columbia has been home to diverse Indigenous peoples for thousands of years. Since BC was colonized in 1858, local First Nations have faced discrimination, violence, displacement, and cultural erasure. Despite the BC government's adoption of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act in 2019, the RCMP continue to forcefully invade Wet'suwet'en land to facilitate construction of an oil pipeline. And they've arrested journalists who were documenting these events. The West Coast Climate Action Network recognizes the right of BC's Indigenous nations to assert and implement their Aboriginal title, rights, treaty rights, and right of self-determination and sovereignty as peoples within their traditional territories. We aim to foster a welcoming and respectful gathering place for Indigenous climate leaders who are working on similar issues, where we can come together to build and exchange knowledge and experiences to guide us into the future. As we all know, one of our responsibilities is to minimize our impact on this land, and climate change is already having a major impact. Climate action needs to be accelerated at all levels of government, including municipal. Municipal governments do have authority and ability to take meaningful climate action. And we can, and our local government team will be doing a number of different things uh, to help promote this work in addition to this roundtable series that's concluding with today's session. So at this point, I'd like to invite Sebastian to do a quick demonstration of what we've got on our local government team website. Sebastian, go ahead. Great, thanks Heather. So you should all be seeing the um, West Coast Climate Action Network's website right now. And just to highlight sort of two areas here on the website um, that are relevant to our presentation here today. Um, the first here is the uh, climate action section. And you can see when you mouse over there, we've got transportation, local government and indigenous perspectives. These are sort of our three main initiatives right now at WeCan with uh, teams um, that are dedicated to each of those different topics. Um, if you click on local government, um, we'll see how quick my internet is. Okay, great. Um, we have uh, a series of roundtables and resources that you can use to um, help out with either if you're thinking of running as a candidate or just want some additional information to help support candidates, as well as this very um, stressful clock that always stresses me out when I look at it. 178 days until the municipal elections. It's uh, getting lower and lower every day. So um, if you click on resources, you'll just get to a series of resources. We have this uh, featured resource, which is one that our team put together, and then a number of other uh, resources from organizations like Climate Caucus or the UBCM. Um, and then our roundtables feature um, the past three roundtables that we've done, and then we'll feature this last roundtable as well once it's completed and uploaded. The other thing that I wanted to mention is just this newsletter button. So we put out a weekly newsletter that is very extensive and has quite a lot of different information and goings on, um, including a lot of things that have to do with local government. Um, though, of course, these are things from all different elements, all different aspects of the BC climate movement. Um, we'd love you to come check it out and um, you can uh, subscribe to it if you aren't subscribed already. Um, it's a really good digest. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, uh, not related directly to the website, but sort of coming up uh, next month, uh, we can actually has our um, AGM and we invite people from uh, the BC climate movement, even if your organization is not a member of we can um, to sort of participate and uh, see the kind of work that we're doing. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to you, Heather. Thank you, Sebastian. 
So we're about to get started here, uh, but first I just want to give everybody a little bit of a heads up of where we're going with this event this evening. So uh, we're going to be having a couple of presentations uh, from our esteemed panelists, who will be uh, Trudy Goals and Dave Mills. We were uh, planning to have a third panelist, uh, Tessica Trong, but unfortunately she has been unable to make it tonight. Um, so we're going to have the two panelist presentations, and that will be followed by a moderated discussion amongst the presenters and some participant questions. So from all of you, um, we do invite you to put any questions that you have for our panelists into the Q&A function in the webinar. Um, and following the question and answer period, uh, we'll have a little bit of a wrap up with the panelists' conclusions, talking a bit about how we can all uh, get involved in our own community um, before we end the evening today. So we will be uh, recording, we are recording this meeting uh, so that it can be posted on our website for those who were not able to make it today. Um, and I'll just introduce to you our moderator. We're pleased to have Basil Langevind here today. Uh, he's highly involved in street safety advocacy uh, and environmental restoration in the Saanich area. And as executive director of an LGBT nonprofit for the last seven years, uh, Basil has developed a unique ability to bring people together despite their differences. So we're really pleased to have Basil here uh, moderating for us today. Um, so many thank yous to uh, all of our guests tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Basil. Wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone. It is so lovely to have you here on this webinar. Uh, I am zooming in today from the unceded territories of the Hawaiian speaking peoples and the Saanich peoples, uh, now known as Greater Victoria. Um, I am a first time candidate in Saanich in the fall election. And so I'm really excited about this panel um, to learn from these uh, panelists who have so much experience and so much to teach us. So with all that said, I will turn things over to our first panelist, Trudy. Thanks, Basil. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Trudy Golds. My pronouns are she and her. I am joining you this evening from the stolen and occupied territory of the Hunkamunum speaking people. Hunkamunum is the downriver dialect, and uh, more commonly and colonially, this is New Westminster. And <clears throat> colonialism did a real number on this area that the history of it is so demolished and diminished that it isn't well known. So I'm committed to learning about the history of this land as it's being relearned by the people who've been here. I'm also um, here tonight because I am the, one of the co-founders of the Feminist Campaign School. Uh, we have been supporting, um, we've supported over 100 candidates getting ready to run across BC this year in the municipal election. Um, we're very excited about the folks who are um, considering this or who have stepped up to be campaign teams uh, to, to support these candidates. I'm also the co-chair at Women Transforming Cities and we're an organization that works collaboratively with city governments to help ensure that we have better policies that center people who are historically forgotten about in our communities. So with all that said, um, I looked at some of the tools that were on the website and saw that you have a lot of campaign planning um, logistical pieces and some tools. So I sort of wanted to talk tonight a little bit about um, how to ground yourself and decide whether or not you're really the right person to be running for this role. So when somebody says to me that they want to run for elected office at the municipal level, I ask them a few questions. The first question I generally ask is, why do you want to run? This is really like the longest job interview that you're going to do to campaign for. So what is it that you want to do when you get into the job? And I really want people to think about what is going to be different after they've been there serving for a few years? What is it? The, what is the work that they want to transform or change? What do they want to bring that's going to be different, unique? and it's really going to elevate the community that they're in. So taking some time to really think about that, I think is really important. But I also like to follow up that question with, why do you be, need to be elected to do that job work? Are you doing that work right now in your community already? And if not, why not? Being elected is not the be all and end all, and it actually can hinder a lot of work that people want to do. I um, spend a lot of time talking with folks who are sitting in elected seats at municipal tables, and they talk about the fact that they can't always do the work that they want to do, that they would actually be more powerful as an advocate outside of the elected system for some things. So depending on what it is that you want to accomplish, where do you really need to be doing that work? Is it at the elected table? Is it in an advocacy role? Is it somewhere else? So I think taking some time and really understanding that and what it is that you want to talk about 
will also just make you a better candidate to really know why you need to be elected. I will say one of my favorite answers to that is because is when somebody says, I've been doing the work, but the only way to elevate it to the next level is to be in the decision making chair. And I understand that for some issues, that's just really where we have to be. And that's where people want to be. The other thing I like to ask people is, who are you running with? And that question is a little bit twofold when I ask that question. One is that it's really hard to be elected by yourself to a committee of people and get any work done if you aren't already in community with them, in allyship with them. I've seen this happen over and over again. I'll pick on the city of Vancouver because they're easy to do right now, right? So we have a really dysfunctional council in some ways because they are really politically divided. So if you are there alone and you do not have someone who's going to second your motions, who's going to help rally support, bring other councillors on your side, are you really ever going to get any work done? And if not, why are you really there? So you don't need to be running with a party or a slate to do that but you need to be running with other people in order to do that. And that also sort of brings me to the next piece, which is why is it you who needs to run? So I think about this a lot myself. So I've had this conversation over the years about whether or not I'm a big fan of municipal politics. I think this is where we actually make the deepest, fastest changes in our communities can be at the municipal tables. And because I'm very passionate about it, people will often ask me why I don't run. And I think, because there are people who are passionate about the same issues that I am, who are doing great work, who are not represented, who I'd rather support. I don't really believe I need another 50 year old, securely housed white woman sitting at a table doing this. I don't bring a unique perspective to it. I don't think that I can look at those issues with a freshness or or a depth that maybe somebody else with a different lived experience can bring to that table. So I really want to support those folks who can do that instead. And that's where I see my role in this is that I really get behind and help campaign, fundraise, support, bring those people to the table who can get that work done. I bring all of this up because I really think that if you're going to be able to stand on a doorstep or tell somebody, hey, I'm running for council, and they ask you, why are you running? You better know this about yourself. You should be deeply secure and rooted in what that answer is going to be so that you can confidently tell somebody why you want to be there, what you want to get done, and why it's you. Why are you the person to actually do this work right now? The other piece I'd like to sort of talk about around this that doesn't get talked a lot about is accountability on campaigns. So as candidates are getting ready to go forward, I really love supporting them to find folks that they can be accountable to. So one of the things I talk about is having an accountability committee. So maybe they are people who are holding you true to your values. So if you are making a decision, so one of the things I put big value in is accessibility. And I chose to go and do a workshop somewhere that wasn't a very accessible space. And I had people who came to me and said, why did you go there? What are you doing there? And I was like, that's right. That wasn't accessible. That wasn't the right choice. I shouldn't have done that. And having people like that on your campaign who can be truthful with you and say, "Are what is what you're doing really aligning to your values and who you really are and what you really stand for? That's a really important piece, I think, to it. They're also the people to be able to stop and check in with when you say, this opportunity just came to me. It seems really good, but do I do this or is it not aligned with who I am? So it can keep you really focused on what it is. And accountability is really important because those same people stay with you after you get elected. So while you're sitting at that council table or that school board table or the park board table, who is gonna come to you and say, where are you going with this? You campaigned on one thing and you went somewhere totally differently with this. How did you get there? Did you learn something differently that got you there or are you just, distracted and we need to help bring you back to where you want to be. So a big piece of it is that I really don't believe that we should ever lead alone. So people who are holding us accountable or helping us lead in community, people that we are canvassing with and campaigning with and bringing them along with us. If you think that you are the best person to, can to be out in council, that's great. But who are you going to be on council with? You should be celebrating somebody else on the doorstep. So here in New Westminster, we have a, a city councilor. She's done a couple of terms here. Her name's Mary Trentadu. And in the last um, election, Mary said, there's no way I'm sitting at a council table without more women here. I'm alone. I can't get the work done. She literally embodies the things that we talk about. So she found some women that she was really excited about having run. And she 
did two things when she campaigned. One was she wasn't concerned about getting herself elected necessarily. She just wanted to make sure at least two of them out of the three got elected. Every doorstep that she went to, if somebody didn't want to listen long enough, she'd say, here, just take my flyer, just, just vote for the women. We just need to get these women elected. In the end, every single woman who ran got elected and they all finished at the very top because they did this for each other every time they were on a doorstep. It wasn't vote for me, it was vote for us. Vote for us because we all bring different skills, we all bring different perspectives. We're here together, we're gonna get the work done. They don't agree on every issue, but they collaborate and work together to get the work done. And that is so important. And it's just really interesting because I think a lot of times when people say, oh, I wanna go run for something, they forget that it's not them alone. You're not going to be sitting all by yourself making a decision. You're at a table with other people. Who do you wanna be sitting beside and who do you wanna be working with? So there you go. That's where I'll kick us off and pass this on to David. Thanks so much, Trudy. That was, that was really great. Um, I'm zooming in today from unceded Comox territory, which is on the east coast of Vancouver Island near the top of the Salish Sea. And for my day job right now, I, uh, I've started a business that helps you know, everyday people and, and homeowners access the carbon market. And I'm on a campaign team that, um, whose goal is, is to help wild salmon make it back to their home stream. But for the past decade, more or less, I've been campaigning um, to persuade people to do things, uh, mostly towards an electoral outcome. So I'm gonna share with you today some of the experience uh, from those past eight years and boil it down to a couple of things that hopefully you can take with you that will help you with your campaign. So the three things that I'm gonna go over today um, are the post-mortem, the pre-mortem, and a strategy to win. So let's all imagine it's the week after the election You've had a couple of days to catch a couple of good nights sleep and reconnect with your family. You've posted your first post thanking uh, your voters and volunteers. You've done a, a couple of media hits and you're now walking into that campaign debrief room with your core team and your core volunteers. It's going to be very emblematic of the campaign you've, you've run because though municipal elections are the easiest to win, the math still is against you. The odds are, are still against you. And for most people, a municipal campaign is your first step on the journey of electoral politics. Most of the people who are leading us today in elected office, they started where you're, where you're thinking about starting right now, uh, a good hard run at a very important position, making really important decisions for, you, for your neighbors and, and being accountable for it. So at that post-mortem meeting, you know, you're going to be looking at the people who are probably gonna be with you for the rest of your career if you've run a good campaign. And I think that's the, the number one piece of advice that I can give, not having run myself, but having been a witness to, or a supporter of, or integrated within an electoral campaign. It's that conversation that you have at the end of it. If you can always keep that in mind as you're going through with it, like Trudy mentioned, it's that team of people um, that you are meeting right now, who are you are asking to stand beside you and stand with you, who will, as Trudy says, hold you accountable uh, when you are eventually elected. Those are first and foremost the people you need to keep in mind because if you've run a good campaign and you ask them, you know, will you back me next time? Most of them are going to raise their hands and say yes. And that means you've got a future in politics um, and your career is just getting started. Even if you didn't win your first race, which you know odds are most of you won't. 
Um, so let's, um, let's then wind all the way back to the very beginning of the process. Um, and I start with a pre-mortem. So I'll look in, at, in a little bit more depth into some of the strategies that I think are helpful um, to run a winning campaign. But once you've assembled you know, your core team, the, 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 the people who first raised their hand and said, yes, I'll help you, like your treasurer, uh, your campaign manager, and your core volunteers, in, in my humble opinion, the most important decision you can make right then and there is to host a pre-mortem. So what do I mean by a pre-mortem? So we all know what an autopsy is and we all know what a, a post-mortem is. A pre-mortem is, is when you're, before your campaign starts, you're, you're kind of looking at that um, cadaver on the slab in the operating room or you're thinking about that debrief that you do at the end of the campaign. And you're trying to imagine all the things that could go wrong. So you can start to build some structures um, for your campaign that will either help you avoid them or allow you to respond in the best way possible when the inevitable things come up. So a pre-mortem doesn't have to be super complicated. And of course, depending on where you are, um, it's gonna look different. So I, I've got a few questions that I, that I wrote down um, and I'm gonna go through them one by one. Treat them as sample questions. If, you, if you've never run a pre-mortem before and you're thinking about um, using this tool in your campaign, uh, here's some sample questions that you can use. And so I'm gonna read them out and then kind of dig in into them uh, one by one. So here's question number one. We concluded our campaign. At the debrief, I asked people to raise their hands. Would they work with me on my next campaign? 80% said yes. Why? So you're asking that question because you're trying to get down to those key points around volunteer retention. What did I do as a candidate to make sure my volunteers came back to me? Did I keep everyone up to date by email? Was I respectful? Did I not waste any of my volunteers' times? Did I get people in their proper roles and support them? Like all those things. If you've done all those things uh, and 80% of the people you know, in your team are saying, yes, I'm, I'm here for the next time, you know, you know you set up all the, all the sort of volunteer retention structures that your campaign needs to be successful. And we all know this is the most important resource you have. So it's the most important question to ask. Um, and that's the first thing that you should ask when you sit down and, and host your pre-mortem. Here's question number two. At the end of the campaign, we asked 10 people why they didn't vote. What did they say? So what does this question help us get at? This question is going to help us develop our turnout program. So we're going to imagine all the reasons why someone didn't vote. I wasn't comfortable going to the polling stations because the mask mandate was over. I couldn't get a ride. Nobody called me. I never heard anything from the candidate. I didn't see anything on social media. So this whole turnout question, you know, I forgot. I forgot. What was election day? I, I totally forgot. I was at work. So this, this question is, is going to elicit the turnout element of your campaign. How are you gonna get your voters out? And that's the second most important question. You've got your volunteers, your, your campaign is going to generate some level of voter support um, or else you, know, you really, as Trudy says, you didn't ask yourself whether or not you should be running or not. So this interview about why someone didn't turn out, that's, that's to help you develop a very clear get out the vote strategy. All right, so question number three. Three days into the campaign, that Facebook post appeared. It said our candidate received an improper donation from the Tides Foundation. How we handled it set the stage for the rest of the campaign. What did we do? So this is like your crisis management question. Every campaign is gonna hit a big speed bump, maybe a couple, 
Every campaign is going to have things come up that they didn't expect. You need some sort of crisis management plan uh, to address that question. So when I did this uh, with the most recent campaign that I, I supported, it was really interesting because the people around the table just started brainstorming. Okay, so what would my opponent say? And would we counter that? Would we just ignore it? Would we try to bury it? Would we try to get an op-ed? You know, How much time was left in the campaign? So it really helps you start thinking about um, putting strategies in place that will make your campaign as resilient as possible. Question number four, one of the volunteers from our, camp, from our competitors campaign, you know, maybe it's a frenemy campaign, but um, you know, the volunteers moved to support your team and they also supported the other team and maybe the other team's candidate win, won and, and you know, you were like, hmm. So I was speaking with one of the vo volunteers from their competitors campaign. We we're talking about, you know, how their candidate won, and, and they showed us the list of voters they called to, to get out the vote. Well, it was our list. So that, that question is like, okay, so what are, the, what are the sort of security structures and data management protocols that uh, you need to put in place? Because you know, you've got your resources, you've got your strategies, you've got your resiliency, you, your voters list or your pool of identified voters that's sort of your final piece of, of um, actual resources that you'll use to deploy. So having some protocols around list security, training for your phone bankers, training for uh, the people who are handing, handling the data collection side of your campaign, that's a critical piece as well. Uh, so that's a rundown of, of a pre-mortem. I think if you imagine yourself in a meeting like that, you can see how it's probably something really useful and something that you could adopt for your campaign. So to close out, I'll give you a few things, um, my, some of my opinions and views about what a winning strategy looks like. Um, the origin story is a place to start. And I think Tr Trudy spent quite a bit of time talking about that. What are the reasons why you're starting to run? Uh, an origin story is really that most critical piece. It's your values on display. It doesn't have to be super complicated. I'm gonna read you one that I just wrote just before uh, this meeting. It relates a little bit to climate. So this is, this is my origin story for my campaign. I saw really good people step up to work on behalf of our city. Like you, I voted for them last time. Now I'm rolling up my sleeve and I'm ready to join them. The hour is late, but there's no better time than the present to tackle the climate crisis. So that's an example of an origin story for your campaign. It's got those three critical components of storytelling, the story of self, the story of us, the story of now. It's pretty short, it's pretty re repeatable. It's like an elevator pitch that you can give in any meeting. So you, you do need an origin story. It shouldn't be false. It should just sort of boil down precisely why it is you wanna run. So that's the first uh, key part of a strategy to win, your origin story. The next key piece for strategies to win and campaigns that win is to develop campaign messages that act like batons. So think about a baton in a relay race. What is its purpose? Its purpose is to energize. It's this object that you're passing from your teammate to propel them forward as fast as they can. So your campaign messages should be like that. They should be energizing. Um, your campaign messages also need to be passed on from person to person. This is very important. So this just like sets a limit on the number of messages you can have to start with. If your campaign messages aren't like batons, it means they're not simple. They're not repeatable. They can't be passed from person to person. And if you can't pass your messages from person to person, that's the definition of a campaign that is no longer or is not persuasive. And persuasion is what a campaign is all about. 
As I said at the beginning, you're trying to get people to do something. Campaign messages, simple, clear, and repeatable, and not too many. Let's say three is a safe rule of thumb. Three core messages. Repeatable, energizing, shareable. That means you're getting outside of your uh, choir and, in, and into building constituency. What else makes a winning strategy? Uh, so using words to win. I'm going to quote Annette Shankar Osario. She's got a podcast called Words to Win By. Uh, I recommend it. She takes a deep dive into campaigns around the world and comes out with the salient reason, the, the right message, the thing that went right in the campaign. So look up words to win by and add it to your podcast playlist. It's good. Um, so this is, this is her quote. Don't take your policies out in public. They're unseemly. So what do we mean by that? It means that most voters aren't up for the job of digesting policies during an election. Most of our voters are getting by day to day, tougher than ever right now. We want them to vote. We can't bog them down with policy. So if you're offering them something, if, if your policy is offering them something, give them the brownie, not the recipe. That's the quote, right? Give them something that they can see and taste and they know it tastes good. Don't give them the recipe about how the brownie's made. If you're showing them a better future, like a nice vacation in a faraway place, show them the beach. Don't talk to them about the airplane and how the airplane was full and it was crowded and it didn't leave on time. And then we lost our baggage and then we got to the airport and eventually we caught a cab to the hotel and eventually show them the beach. So words to win by, don't take your policies out in public. This is the campaign strategy that's going to help you to develop those key messages that are persuadable, that get passed from person to person. Uh, an obvious one, often repeated, make sure your campaign stays in your frame. So if you're finding that you're out in the field debating your opponent's messages, you are not winning. You must always stay in your campaign frame. Finally, I'll conclude by saying, make sure your messages address material security, right? So this is being hosted by WeCan, and this is a very important election about climate change and climate policy is complex. And I've told you, don't bog people down with climate policy, but it is also the thing that's motivating you to step up and run if you're on this webinar. So how could I say something very simple about climate policy that would address the, the main things that voters will vote on. Because in the municipal election, voters will vote on things related to material security. So our climate messaging should get around to addressing those core concerns that every, everybody has. So material security is like your safety, your financial well being, your prosperity. Um, Things like taxation, of course, and shelter and housing, um, access to transit, affordability, inflation, those are all really triggering things for voters and are often things that are out of your control, but nonetheless impact people's voting decisions. So here's a quick little pitch on how do you address material security while still running a really solid campaign on climate. So instead of talking about climate policy that will reduce household emissions, tell voters your platform will put a heat pump in every home to make people safe and make our climate future more secure. So you, you bring it back to the heat pump, right? It addresses that issue of household emissions. It addresses that issue of surviving heat waves. You don't need to talk about all the policies that created the heat dome. You don't need to talk about all the failed policies that are, that are leading to our emissions rising and the complicated ways that you're going to address them. A heat pump in every home. That's what our campaign is going to deliver. It's going to keep your family safe. It's going to lower emissions in our communities. So that's it for me. Uh, I really appreciate the time and I'm happy along with Trudy to 
join the conversation and answer any questions. And I'd really like to thank We Can for the opportunity to speak. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, David and Trudy. Those were both such helpful, fascinating presentations. I've taken notes and I'm going to have to go back and watch again and, and learn more and more from you. So fabulous. Um, I see we have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, if you do have questions, uh, something that you'd like to ask our panelists, do put it in the Q&A and I'll be reading them out as we go. Um, but to get started, perhaps I have a question for Trudy. Um, you talked a lot about how we want diverse uh, voices at the table, how we want people who bring new ideas, who bring different identities that aren't typically represented. Um, I am somewhat a diverse voice in that I'm LGBT and have these other identities. And as I've been campaigning, it's not infrequent for me to come across homophobia, queer phobia, bigotry. Um, and I know as a person who's very privileged, as someone who's white, um, I'm certainly not facing the brunt of it. So. My question for you, Trudy, is how do candidates who come from more marginalized and um, stigmatized backgrounds, how do they respond to that and how do they take care of themselves to continue through a campaign? Ugh. Yeah, that's the big question, isn't it, Basil? It really is. Um, yeah, this entire system, the process of campaigning, of leading, the way our government is set up is not made for anyone other than a, a straight, able-bodied white man. That's who it was designed for. That's who it was designed by. And it shows up a lot. And it is really important to think about strategies for um, security, for self-care as you're going out and campaigning. Um, there's a few things. I mean, I think like my golden rule for people is just don't engage with somebody. You can just say thanks and walk away. If you're out door knocking and somebody says something that is harmful to you, have a nice night and you just walk away and leave. Do not be there. But also have a strategy in place before you go do that to deal with it afterwards. So maybe it is um, always campaigning with other folks. I really like being out in teams, especially when you're door knocking. It's a safety piece. It also, like, it helps buoy your spirits. You get to celebrate the good conversations, debrief the difficult ones, decide together whether or not you're going to keep going. It can really help move people along. Helps if you bring somebody who can help get in between you and somebody else. Maybe they're the ones who say thanks, good night, and walk the candidate off the doorstep so that they don't have to keep in that conversation. Maybe there's another team who's out there waiting for you who can help provide you an opportunity to debrief, decide how you're going to deal with it. Having a strategy and being intentional about it is probably the two best things to think about because we cannot we cannot change the way other people are going to behave. We can only change the way that we're going to respond in that moment. And that's really, I think, the biggest piece that I think about in the campaigning part. And just recognize like this is not a process or a, or a system that was made to be safe for anybody else to go and do it. It really isn't. It's unfortunate. And I'm sorry you're experiencing that. Thank you. That is that is helpful. Um, and yeah, I think as as candidates step up. Um, the other thing that I've found really valuable is having a team. As, as you talked about before, Trudy, a team of people who can support you. That's super, super valuable. So thank you for sharing that. Um, one question for David, and then I'm going to read through the Q&A and see what we've got here. Um, you talked about the importance of having key campaign messages that people pass on like a baton, which I think is such a good metaphor. Um, I recently read a book called Microscript Rules, which tells you how to craft these really short um, statements. It's, it's a fantastic uh, read. And the quote that I remember most from it is, it's not what you tell people that matters, it's what they repeat after. Um, and I think that really, really connects with what you're saying. So my question for you, David, is, what are some examples of those short, snappy campaign messages and why do they work? Sure, I could maybe riff on your last example a little bit to throw one at you. So on that door, when you're facing uh, someone who is coming from a position of fear, so they're exhibiting a discriminatory stance um, or resistance to something that's different, you know, you can see right away that this is like the fear-based campaigning that the right uses. So you wanna identify yourself 
as a progressive voter and you say on our side, us progressive, th this is what we believe. We believe communities, safe communities are communities that are safe for everyone. And that's, we all voted on that last time and that's why Nanaimo elected a progressive council. And that's why I'm out running. Communities that are safe are safe for everyone. So repeatable, off the cuff, um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that's great. Um, wonderful. I will bring up a question from the chat. Um, and so everyone knows within the Q&A, you can also vote on questions. So if you see something that you really want asked, you can vote on it and I will be more likely to see it. Uh, Anna asks, uh, this is probably a question mostly aimed at Trudy. You talked a lot about deciding whether you're the right person to run um, and whether running is a good idea. Anna asks, how do we know if our goals can be better met through advocacy rather than being at the council table? Yeah, thanks for that, Anna. <clears throat> it's also a really good question, and I don't think it has a really straight answer. Um, I would say it's really important to think through. So one thing is nobody gets more radical once they get elected. You need to make a lot of compromises once you've been elected on other things. You don't really get to push things necessarily as far as you might want to go. Um, so, and you don't get to only work on the things that you want to work on. So I want to like people to think about the whole thing. I remember talking to somebody who was surprised at how much their job really is like 80% on councils about land use. And that's not what they wanted to run for. And then they won and then they were suddenly having to learn about land use and, and the policies that they really wanted to work on were really off the side of their desk when they had extra time. So <clears throat> what is it that you really want to accomplish? Um, how radical do you want to be in doing that work? Can it only be done, like, do you need to be elected at the municipal level so that you can make local changes at your city and leverage your elected role to advocate to other levels of government? Um, what else do you want to be there? I know David made a comment that, um, that really sat with me around the idea that traditionally a lot of people have run for municipal government to use it as a stepping stone to a different political life that they want somewhere that they want to lead at another level of government and i would say our best leaders in the municipal world are the people who love their cities and want to actually invest in doing the work at their city table so if you are if your goal is to change federal policy go run for a federal seat go run for mp if you really want to change that policy at your local level and do that work then consider running for your city council and if what you really want to do is be able to advocate everywhere and be maybe farther on the edge and stay in a particular issue that you're really passionate about. Like I have issues that I'm really interested in that I couldn't work on at a city table, then stay out there and be an advocate. And yeah, it is a big decision to make. I, there isn't a right or a wrong answer. There's just lots of things to think about, I think, as you think it through. Some great thoughts. Thank you so much, Trudy. Uh, another question here from one of the participants. I'm not sure who their name. They ask, do you have any tips on how to find a great campaign manager and volunteers? David, do you wanna give this one a try? Sure. I would say that it's your very close friends, even your spouse. Um, most of us who are at this level of politics can't go out and pay $75,000 to have a professional campaign net manager with a decade's worth of communication experience come and run our campaigns someone you trust, someone who believes in you. Um, and like the last question was a little bit around like that role of activists, like should I be a counselor? Should I stay in the role of activists? Um, both are always gonna be needed. So someone from that activist community who is gonna be with you for the duration of the campaign. And then when you're making those hard decisions about land use, which have huge impacts on our community, by the way, like let's, let's remember that, like these are huge decisions. You're gonna have to sit there and go through all those details to make the right one. Your activist friend who came and stood by you as a campaign manager, um, they're still gonna be in that community applying that pressure that's gonna lift you up, hold you to account, help you make that decision once you're elected. That's great, thank you. Wonderful. Um, another question. Let's jump right in. Something that's certainly been on my mind a lot as I'm campaigning, and I'm sure on the minds of every council candidate, um, in BC, this is the first election that we're running in a pandemic. And so what does 
campaigning look like in the era of COVID? Do either of you, David or Trudy, have thoughts on running a campaign in these pandemic times? Yeah, there's also a challenging question, isn't it? So um, David brought up probably the most important thing in a campaign is that you need to get out the vote strategy. So you need to be able to find your voters and then get them out on election day to vote for you. And traditionally, door-to-door -door campaigning is what works. That's where you get to know somebody, get their support, can go back on election day, say, have you voted, get out and come vote with me. So um, it's really tough to transition that. We've seen it through the provincial and the federal elections that have happened during the pandemic, that there's been some shift to digital um, campaigning. It is uh, more expensive because you need to be able to buy resources or lease them to be able to do that. It is not nearly as effective. We're also seeing is that it doesn't get out people in the same way. Social media does not win a campaign because you cannot identify your voters and you cannot call them on election day and ask them to come out and vote for you. So <clears throat> where am I going with all that, <laughs> I guess? Um, I think it is that you need to make some strategic decisions. So if you think about it, door knocking is gonna happen mostly on single family homes. So you're outdoors on a porch, you can be masked, you could take strategies like that if you wish to, knowing full well that maybe fewer people are gonna open their doors this time around. So maybe it's also having a really good leave behind for them, whether it's a door knock or a leaflet if you're doing that. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting challenge that nobody has a fantastic answer to yet. There's lots of options out there, but unless maybe David's got like a brilliant answer for us that I haven't thought of, but yeah. All right, David, no let's hear your brilliant answer. Okay, I've got a couple. Um, the <laughs> observation's correct. Turnout is down. So is that a bad thing? It might not be. So Trudy said, what's the most important thing? Getting out the vote. What's the most important tactic? door knocking. If turnouts are lower and you're willing to hit some doors, your chances of winning are going to go up. That's a fact. So in the by-election that just happened in Comox, it was uh, during the fall, during the pandemic, not a great time. Um, the candidate who got the most votes knocked on the most doors, full stop. So that's just like undisputable. There's three strategies to win. Knock on doors, knock on doors, knock on doors. That candidate did that, that candidate handedly won. Um, so that's the best thing you can do. And I don't think the pandemic is a huge barrier to that. You can stand 10 feet back after you ring a doorbell, right? And, you know, in my role as a activist campaigner who does spend a fair bit of time on petitions, um, a lot of that got shut down. A lot of that door knocking got shut down during the pandemic. But when we went out uh, last summer and knocked on doors, we didn't find that people were like, get off my porch, this is a pandemic. I, I just never heard that. Um, didn't maybe knock on enough doors to like confirm it. So that's your strategy. Knock on the doors and low turnout might actually be your friend if it holds. Uh, the second thing I'll say is have a couple of posts that are shareable, that are third party, you know, like an op-ed type Facebook post that really details your campaign, ideally a friendly media piece that you can share um, with people that, you know, comes from the perspective of outside of your campaign. So, you know, I, digital strategy is expensive. It's expensive to you know, have all that work properly on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. But if you can have a couple of digital posts on Facebook or a friendly local media outlet um, that can be shared, that can really help your campaign. So it's that follow-up. If people aren't necessarily opening the doors or you're in dense neighborhoods where the apartment buildings are hard to get into, having a couple people that you can get access to and then having them share that post is a way to sort of combine some of the digital with some of the real world stuff that actually wins your campaign. Great. Thank you for both of your thoughts. That's uh, certainly helpful. And as I've been on the doorstep wearing an N95 mask, um, I, like you echoed, David, I haven't really heard people concerned about um, the pandemic at this point. So at least in that context, which is great. Um, so a question here, 
what are the biggest differences between running in a smaller community versus a larger community, different sized races? Anyone of you like to take that question? Huge advantage in a small town uh, because you know you can literally knock on every door. So door knocking being the best tactic, the advantage goes to a small town in my view. Yeah, I would totally agree with David on that, that the smaller your community, um, the more likely you are to talk to every voter if you put in the time for it. The um, yeah, I think that's probably like the biggest advantage. I mean, it's different in the different sizes, different cities. We're seeing our bigger cities have parties. So there's parties at the municipal level. It's really difficult to run as an independent and win in Vancouver or Burnaby or even Surrey now. So yeah, I think that there's lots of differences depending on the size of those cities. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um... Wonderful. It, it really sounds like it all comes back to getting in front of people, talking to as many people as you can, building those those human connections, knocking on doors every night, if you can, if you can spare the time. All right, I'm going to have a question from Peter here. This is going back to something that David talked about quite a lot in his um, presentation, which was when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about these big issues, presenting positive solutions. So Peter asks why so many candidates um, tend to focus on the doom and gloom, and I guess have a hard time transitioning to that, those positive can-do solution attitudes, and how can we make that transition as candidates? David, would you like to start on that? Sure. I mean, it is hard to get out of the doom and gloom right now because there's a lot of it out there. And I think also it can be a little bit more, it's tempting to maybe stay in that doom and gloom because we do see that fear-based messaging work for certain campaigns. So if we think about the classic Trump or Republican campaign or possibly the coming conservative campaign that's sort of branded as populist, they are usually fear-based campaigns. Immigrants are coming to steal your jobs. The carbon tax is going to make your life unaffordable. You know, there are campaigns that are stuck with the doom and gloom because fear works for their base. It is a way to enrage their base and that sort of enragement turns them out. And so maybe some of our politicians um, that are on the progressive side are seeing that and they think, okay, well, I can learn from that and I'm going to stick with the doom and gloom and, and scare people. I think that probably doesn't work for our base. Our base does need to see constructive solutions. And I think the problem that I alluded to was making those solutions relatable. So the heat pump helped me survive the heat dome, you know? That's a story I heard a lot. And that's a story I would wanna like repeat. It's very practical and it's very relatable. So when we can make policy relatable to people, that's when we're gonna win. And if we can make that message constructive and solutions oriented, that's when we're gonna reach our base. Our base is about construction. Our base is about building. Our base is about solutions. That's not what our opponents are about. They're about mostly about fear and just triggering that turnout. So it is harder for us to get our base sort of activated and uh, engaged. It's easier for the right to do that. But uh, I just gotta reinforce, that's where the creativity comes in. You gotta spend the time to really craft those messages and make them repeatable and simple and solutions oriented. Wonderful. Can I build on that? Right, of course. Yeah, so uh, you're right. I would stay way away from negative messaging. I mean, I, who really wants to go out and be negative? I don't think any of us want more of that in our lives. My experience, so I've worked on a number of campaigns where the candidate has been the top vote getter. They've like they've blown other candidates out of the water. And the big part that they do when they're outdoor knocking is that they're listening. So they're there to connect on the issue and listen and hear about what actually matters to people. So if I think about if you're going out and you are passionate about climate and that's what you really know, 
and you go to someone's door and they say, I am really concerned because the garbage doesn't get picked up often enough. You need to convert that conversation into something that you want to talk about. Well, how, what would actually help besides more frequent pickups? How do we actually reduce this in our community? Did you know that this exists or we could do this in our community? And it's giving people hope that there's change that can actually help solve things. Sometimes they need a minute to vent and get out that bit of frustration and anger, but they also want to see hope in the people I think that they're electing. I think like, you know, David talks about like the difference between the left and the right. I think people on the left want hope. We want to work towards things. And I think it is, is sharing with people what we connect on, what we have that, that we share in our values so that we can see where it could go. Can't promise what we're going to do because we don't know what's going to happen once we're elected that we can do it, but that we hear them and that we're working towards the same kinds of solutions together. Yeah, that's really great. Thank you. Um, sort of to build on that question, and I'll throw this one back to you um, again, Trudy. This question is from Anna. So how do you start that conversation on the doorstep? Oh, Anna. Well, <laughs> so nobody likes to do this, but it is super helpful. And that is doing some role playing before you actually go out and get on the doorstep. Rather than trying this out the first time with some angry person so you've just interrupted somebody who's having a tough day and the whoops pot's boiling over and there's a kid crying and a dog barking and you're trying to say vote for me practice this a little bit with some friends so that you can get used to that so um david's really right having a couple of key messages that you can get out are really good and it can be as simple as you know i'm trudy i'm running for city council I see that you're really busy. Do you, would you like to talk with me right now about something that's like, that you, you know, what you're interested in this election? No, could I leave something behind and maybe come back again? You should be keeping notes when you're on the doorstep. Somebody should have a clipboard and a note board so that if you have time, you get to go back there. If you see that they've got, um, you know, bicycles sitting outside, maybe you open up your conversation with, you know, are you're an avid cyclist, so am I. You know, I'm looking at more bike lanes in this part of town. What do you think of that? And get some feedback from them and listen to them. So you can find clues in what you're seeing around you to be able to connect with somebody. Um, it's not that hard once you get started on it. Um, quite often, at least in the city, when you're campaigning on the doorstep, you sort of get a mix half and half of people who are like, great, thanks, just leave me a flyer. I don't really want to talk to you tonight because I'm busy. And people who really want to engage in a conversation about the person who always parks in front of their house or whatever their issue is. So. That's great. Thank you, Trudy. David, do you have something to build on that? I could build a little bit on that. Those are great points. Um, if you're struggling to think up uh, something that you think is going to be relevant to that person, that neighborhood, one tactic you could use is, you know, I just, I'm Jane and I'm running for city council. I was just speaking with your neighbor and they told me their concern is, is that a concern for you? So that'd be like a really quick opening pitch. I heard your neighbors say they'd like to see more bike lines in this community, you know, seeing that bicycle parked beside the step as you walked up. Um, is that an issue for you? So you could start with like kind of a question that is relatable based on what a neighbor said. And if that fails, you know, what are the issues that concern you most in city politics today? Just get a bit more open-ended. Those are both fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and if I, I will add one quick thing from my own experience, there's a lot of doors in your community and it's okay if your first 10 are wrong and you don't get it right right away. You know. You, Try things out, try new things, play with, play around with it. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts. Wonderful, let me look at some more questions. Okay, so from an anonymous uh, commenter, what community groups should a candidate reach out to? For example, business associations, environmental groups, university clubs, and to make this a, a little broader, how do you make those connections? Boy, a great example from Comox here. Uh, you know, the candidate very well organized, okay? So could see the election coming for a while, had made the decision a long ways ahead, put a campaign team together, was ready when the election was called. What did that candidate do to engage those groups? Hosted a listening event, a community listening event in the local park and put the word out. I want to hear from the cycling community you know, just reached out to the environmental club, the youth club, the affordable housing advocates. 
I'm hosting a listening event. I want to hear from you. It's one morning only at the local park. Come on out and tell me what's on your mind and I'll build my campaign around it. It was brilliant. So before the campaign even started, the candidate had heard all those top concerns, had developed campaign material that reflected them and had some confidence going out into the community knowing a lot of the issues were already surfaced at an event that he hosted and he got some press uh, about it too. So there's a brilliant little piece of strategy for people who are organized and we've all got enough time between now and the election to do something like that. Fantastic, wonderful. Any thoughts, Trudy? Um, yeah, I would always ask why you're reaching out to those organizations now and why you haven't been talking to them in the past. Like, why weren't you engaged? So. I think about this a lot. My MP is one of those terrible people. I mean, he's a great MP and yet he will show up at, he will go engage with organizations in a campaign so that he can get a photo opportunity and say he's heard them, um, as opposed to always having an ongoing relationship with them. He's been doing this for a long time. There's loads of times when you could be engaged in conversation, understanding things, bringing people into your, into your community, being able to work in community with them. So I would just, pause and think about why you want to engage with them now, what it is that you want out of it. It's one thing to say, hey, sorry, I've never had time to come and talk to you. Let's sit down and have a conversation because I want to know what I'm missing in my platform. I want to know who I'm not listening to. How can I engage you in my campaign? It's different to go and say, hey, I'm going to represent you because I came and had a coffee with you. So I would just be really thoughtful about how we engage with, with groups and organizations. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Going back a little bit to what Trudy was talking about and the importance of listening, Amy asks, how do you balance sharing your own story and interests with listening to the voices and interests of others? Trudy, do you wanna start with this one? Yeah, I. Um, <clears throat> so my experience on the doorstep is that um, more often than not, people want to be heard than want to listen. They want to hear that you have something in common with them, but they don't necessarily want to hear your backstory. And when we show up and we're like, hey, this is who I am, this is what I'm about, vote for me, is actually less effective than, hi, I'm here because I'm running for the city because I really love this city and I'd love to hear like what you what you're thinking about. And engaging people in that kind of conversation. Your connection with them will come out through that conversation. When they say something like, well, you know, I'm really concerned that we don't have enough housing in this neighborhood. Yeah, me too. I've actually been working on housing for a long time. And then you talk about the thing that's relevant to them rather than giving them an entire resume. Um, so I think that that's really important. Um, and there is a point when you have to stop with the listening and be more uh, more proactive and more active in your in your campaign as well. So at a all candidates meeting or a town hall, you are absolutely there to talk about yourself and your issues on somebody's doorstep or if you were invited to their amenity room in their condo or whatever, you're probably there to get to know more about what it is that those voters want to hear about. So, and then they may ask you questions that you can answer. That's really great. David, do you have thoughts? Couldn't have sent it better. Uh, plus one to everything. Yeah, excellent. I will take a, a moment to find another question here. Um, we are finishing at 8.30 or earlier if, if that happens. So now is the time to post your questions. There is a question that I can see in my chat from Sebastian. It looks like Perfect. how much campaigning is happening right now? When should people start? If you know that you're running, you should start now. Mm -hmm. You should door knock now. You should door knock this weekend because you want to hit every door. And if you start now, there's a really good chance you'll hit every door. So I'm sorry, I, I took your job there, Basil. Back no, to that's that's helpful, I appreciate. We're sharing the burden, fabulous. Oh, now I've lost the questions, okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, maybe a question for people who are not themselves necessarily running. Uh, Ian Brown asks, how can we find committed climate candidates? And I suppose in our communities, other people that can step up and be that representation we want. Who 
Well, you are all the climate experts here. It certainly isn't me. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fair so enough. I would say um, look at the people that you are in community with and who you're engaged with, who's doing great work that you admire. Don't just ask them, but this will be my thing is please do not just ask people to run, especially if you are asking women or racialized people or people with disabilities to run. It is not enough because it just lays a burden on them. Offer them support, like really tangible support. I would like you to run and I could recruit 10 volunteers for you, fundraise $1,000 and I will show up three nights to, to door knock with you. Like there's really tangible ways to actually show up for people and make that offer when you ask them if they are interested in running so that they know that they're not going to be out there alone. That's great. I agree. That offering of community support just might be that little thing that gives someone that extra bit of courage to take that really important step. So offer that support as often as you can. Yeah, and then do it, right? So. <laughs> Absolutely. Great answers. Bruce has sent in another Q&A said, hey, Basil, ask mine above. So let's go find Bruce's question. Uh, Bruce asks, how many campaign volunteers are typical for a successful campaign? And how much money per capita is needed? How much do you need to raise? Well, how's this? I'll give this a stab at this because we actually talk about working out the math of this a lot in campaign school. So <clears throat> there are some things that you can think about depending on how big your campaign is. You're going to think about a core campaign team. So you're going to need a few volunteers there. And if you were running like a fairly small campaign, you need a financial agent, maybe a campaign manager, depending on like the size of your campaign, if you're in a really small community. If you're in a larger center, though, I would actually sit down and figure out how many votes you need to win how many doors you need to knock on to find those votes. You can door knock about 50 doors a night, roughly, let's say, for a team of two people, and then figure out how many volunteers you're gonna to need to help get you out there and get that done. If that's the that's the basic piece, that's what I would go after. That would be the most important part. The spending, I mean, there's a spending limit for everybody. So the if you go on Elections BC website, you can find out what the cap is for your community, and it's based on a per capita um, number. And it can vary. So incumbents have a huge advantage. If they kept last time signs, they don't need to buy signs again. Um, if they have, if they kept their website renewed and they've got people coming to it, like they've got some expenses that are already covered for them. You don't need to do everything though. So really pick and choose what you need to do. A mailer is really expensive, but can be really effective if you have a lot of apartment buildings where you live. Maybe that's the only way you're going to get to those people is an unaddressed mailer. Um, signs can be really expensive. Do you really need them? Our community just actually passed a bylaw that they can't put up big election signs anymore to help make it more equitable so you don't have to raise as much money to run. So yeah, it's really sort of figuring out where you need to create a budget and then fundraise for your budget is sort of the direction I would go in. David, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that assessment of location is very important. It'll determine the types of materials you invest in. Uh, so I'll start with a budget. Uh, I would say minimum $3,000 cash on hand for your campaign. Because uh, you need to be able to either print those uh, rat cards or pamphlets that are going to go with you to the door, or you need to do some signs or a combination of you know that if you're doing the neighborhood type stuff, or you need that amount of money to purchase Facebook ads or purchase your digital whatever digital thing you're going to do to reach the doors that you can't reach because your area is very dense and everyone lives in apartment buildings you can't get in those apartment buildings because you're gated. So that's your situation. You have to spend some money on digital uh, and you have to pay to boost your content and pay to get your message in front of people. So let's say 3000 as the minimum. Um, and obviously if you got more, it, it, it's useful. Um, for volunteers, let's say 20. And let's say with a caveat that 10 of them must be willing to knock on doors. I think if you have 20 volunteers and 10 of them are willing to knock on doors, and a couple of people are willing to do the phoning and a couple of people are willing to do data, data entry and there's that campaign manager and treasurer, you've got a winning team. Wonderful. Um, one other note on fundraising because it is very uh, municipality dependent and I could not win a campaign here in Sandwich on $3,000. Um, if you go onto the Elections BC website, there are financial disclosures from 
all the past elections and you can see how much every candidate spent and where they spent their money. So for me, doing that research and figuring out who, which candidates had the most best voter efficiency as far as fundraising, which candidates um, were successful or not depending on fundraising, again, is very helpful. Um, so I think that'll also help give, give more local context. All right. Um, we are, we're close to wrapping up, so get your last questions in here. Um, let's see. Someone's asking, what are some unexpected places that you found or candidates can find enthusiastic supporters? I hate to keep talking about doorstaps, but they really are. But I will tell you a little story about this. So um, in the last election here in uh, New West, Nidhi Nakagawa was a first time candidate. She's a very progressive um, candidate and she was out door knocking and knocked on the door of somebody who is um, a philosophy professor and a very devout Catholic and wanted to have a very deep conversation with her on the doorstep. And by the time they'd finished that conversation, including like having a conversation about like faith based politics, like all kinds of things, they ended up having about a 15 minute conversation and that he and his wife ended up coming out five nights of door knocking with her and have been with her the entire time she's been in office. So um, yeah, sometimes you find the most surprising people in your community who you never would have met. And I think that's probably one of the best things is the community building that happens through this. Wonderful. I'll echo Trudy to say that it's just a proven fact that doors are the most effective places to find people regardless. So if you have to base your campaign time around meeting people, make sure the vast majority of it is on the doorstep. However, not every time is good for the doors. So streeting, standing out on the street in a busy part of your town is a good way to meet some people. And maybe a part that is overlooked is your friend community. You might assume that all of your friends and relatives and all those people you know and all the close people they know are going to vote for you. However, in municipal elections, that's just not true. Most of your friends will vote at the background rate of about 35%. So your friend community and those people who you know are for sure a resource. They will actually make up a percentage of your support on election day, but you still have to ask them to vote for you. Yeah. So do that. Don't forget about your friends and your neighbors and their friends. Very helpful. All comes back to door knocking. Okay, so in, in a similar question from Matthew, what is a good strategy to canvas apartment buildings which have fobbed access? Or yes. just apartment buildings in general? Yeah, so hi you. Matthew. Um, <laughs> um, I know Matthew, I saw that question come up. So uh, in the Election Act, there's actually uh, legislation that says that you have to get actually you are legally allowed to go in and canvas inside of all apartments and condos. Um, so with if you know it's a purpose built rental building contact the rental management agency in writing, I would do it so that you get a written response back to find out when you can get into the building. Generally, somebody will have to be with you who can let you into each floor because of the fob access. Um, same thing with condos a little challenging because you need to know who the strata is. Um, so sometimes finding somebody who's in there. So I live in a high density neighborhood with uh, one purpose built rental building and the rest are all stratified buildings. And we're talking as a community about how we can bring all the candidates in over a couple of weekends to do nothing but door knocking so they can hit 2500 homes over a couple of days essentially. Um, so we're coming up with strategies within that so I would find some champions in your community who can help with that. Um, but you can also go to like the strata management companies and talk with them about how to get into the buildings that they manage. Legally, they have to let you in. Great. Well, I think that is about it for our questions tonight. It's been such a fascinating discussion. I've learned so much, so thank you both. Um, I suppose we'll end off with closing thoughts and anything you want to share or promote. Trudy, would you like to start? Sure, thanks. I love Q&A. Like, I love to know what's on people's mind and try and help them out and answer them. So thanks for all the questions. 
Um, one of the things that we didn't really talk about was the fact that, you know, we talk about door knocking a lot. This is an incredibly ableist system as well. Um, disabled, physically disabled people do not go out and campaign because there is no way to. So if you were thinking about campaigning, I would love you to think about strategies that you can work with somebody who is disabled, who maybe wants to canvas, who wants to support you with canvassing and how you can work on that together. I think that we need to engage more people into this process and not less and make it more inclusive and less exclusive. Um, I would also think very heavily about um, about other strategies that you can use. So one of the things that City of Vancouver is doing is they're doing candidate one-on-one sessions and they are talking a lot about how to um, have uh, translated materials go out in your community. So if you know that, if you go and have a quick look on town, the Townfolio website, you can see what languages are spoken in your community. Maybe consider doing some translated stuff on your printed materials for folks. So even if it's the election date and the location where they can vote or, just general information for people is really helpful, shows that you're really paying attention who's in your community. Um, I will tell you that the last thing is that if you have, um, one of the projects we're working on at Women Transforming Cities, I have so many things I could promote, but this would be the one, um, is that we are um, connecting with elected, we're actually connecting with every municipality in BC to ask them how they're coming along with the nine calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we've actually not had a great turnout from a lot of communities. So if you uh, feel like you would like to take one action this week, perhaps contact your local municipality and ask them if they've answered our survey. So it's the Women Transforming Cities Survey on Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Maybe just nag your favorite counselor and ask them to find out if they've responded to that. Because we're just trying to take a, like a little temperature check and find out how it's going and what sort of resources folks need to make sure this work gets done. So thanks. Thank you so much, Trudy. And David, same question for you. Closing thoughts and anything you'd like to share or promote? I would just say my closing thought would be if you're at the point where you're ready to step into the ring or just recently step into the ring and you haven't already sat down with an, uh, an existing sitting counselor, reach out and have that conversation. That's another source of very valuable and realistic advice and maybe some support down the road. So take the time to have a conversation with someone who's elected at the level that you're trying to get elected to. That's all I've got to add. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. And I suppose I will take an opportunity to share something that I've been working on that I think will be really useful to local candidates. So um, I have a background in web development. And as I've been on the doorstep, I've been trying to find an app or some system to work to to keep track of voter information, um, the issues people are talking about, the priorities they have, and haven't come up with anything useful. So I thought, why don't I just make something myself? So all that being said, um, I'm about two weeks away from finalizing this. Uh, it's something built specifically for progressive candidates because I really believe in supporting other candidates around BC. Um, it, the website is doorknock.app, doorknock.app. Um, it's a really clean, simple, intuitive interface that you can use with your volunteers. Um, and I think it'll be really helpful for a lot of candidates to collect that voter information on the doorstep. Great. And that is my, that is my little plug. Um, and I think I'll throw it back to Heather now because our little panel here is all wrapped up. Thank you so much, David and Trudy, for all of your fabulous wisdom and thoughts. Thank you, Basil. And I am excited to check out your app when it's ready. That sounds like a great resource. Um, I'll, I will just uh, say again how much we, we really, really appreciate the generosity of our panelists, uh, David and Trudy, as well as our moderator, Basil. Um, it's, it's so amazing that we can come together as a community like this and that you're uh, you know, willing to share your hard-earned expertise and wisdom with uh, the folks who are, are just getting into this and, and wanting to build their confidence for their campaigns or support their local climate candidates. Um, so let's all, you know, maybe just pop into the chat, uh, you know, appreciations and thanks for, for everybody who's worked to put this together and given their time. Um, and uh, yeah, just invite everybody to, you know, keep an eye on the WeCan website events page. 
There's lots of climate re related events from all across the province that are always popping up on there. Um, you know, sign up for our mailing list if you want to get uh, informed about things as they happen. Uh, and please do use the website to contact us with any suggestions that you might have for initiatives, feedback, uh, your ideas. If you're interested in volunteering, we're always uh, looking for people to pitch in and help out with the different aspects of the weekend work. Uh, if you have uh, resources to donate financially, that's always really helpful as well. Um, so we do look forward to hearing from anybody uh, who would like to follow up with us. And I'll uh, just close by saying on behalf of WeCan, uh, thank you everyone, all the participants for the great questions um, and for everybody for making time for this in your evening. Uh, please stay healthy and have a great night. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone.